Today I'm going to be testing out this paint set, the cheapest, highest ranked acrylic paint and brush set on Amazon to see if they're good enough to paint miniatures. My name's Guy, you're watching Midwinter Minis, this video is sponsored by Ravage Star, and the acrylic paints people use to paint minis are of exceptionally high quality. They have a really velvety, smooth consistency that doesn't leave texture or brush marks on the models, their pigments are really intense and vibrant, loads of them are incredibly opaque, even after just one thin coat, and they dry with a really non-reflective matte finish. And because of that, people use them to create some of the most incredibly beautiful three-dimensional works of art you have ever seen. But that quality comes at a cost. For example, Citadel paints are super popular in the hobby, but boy oh boy are they pricey. A standard 12mm pot will set you back 275, which doesn't sound too bad, but realistically you're going to need more than one colour, and by the time you've bought yourself all the paints you need for your army and a few brushes, you'll have set yourself back a small fortune. Well, don't sell your kidneys just yet, because the £24 or $30 Fanta Story starter set is here to save the day. Or is it? Let's have a look. 24 bottles, 60 mils each. That's extremely good value compared to the Citadel paints. Let's do some quick dirty maths. 24 bottles, 60 mils each, that's roughly 1.4 litres of paint. 24 quid for all of it, that's about 1.5p per milliliter. Compare that to Citadel paint at 23p per milliliter, and we're looking at paint that's 15 times cheaper than the best known brand in Warhammer paint. But uh, don't go forgetting about the free brushes inside too. A set of 10, uh, it doesn't say what kind, I'm guessing simple cheap Taclon synthetic brushes, but still a decent range of sizes, some more traditional artist brushes that won't be so useful for miniature paints, but a good few base coating or dry brush size brushes, and a size 3, 2 and 1. Basically as small as I ever go in brushes anyway, so not too bad. The thing is though, are the paints any good? Any clues on Amazon? 7,000 global reviews, averaging 4.6 out of 5. Wow, this stuff must be pretty awesome. I think we might be onto a winner. A good choice of colours, a nice mix of everything, but maybe I'd have liked to seen one of the many blues or greens swapped with a metallic silver or gold. None of those in here. Also, no pre-mixed usable skin tones or any brown or black washes, for example. Most of the paints have their traditional artist colour names too. Van Dyke Brown, Sap Green, Thalo Blue. And actually, as a painter with partial colour blindness, I find that way more useful than the weird fantasy names that hobby companies usually give their paints. As I was unpacking them, Hattie was keen to test them out, so she primed a sheet of card with grey plastic primer, the same stuff we use on all of our minis we paint, to see how the paint would react, what they look like, and how opaque they are, painting the whole of each square with one coat, and then the bottom half of each square with a second coat. So what are we looking at here? Some real standout decent paints, but Jesus, some absolute garbage as well. Obviously Amazon or Fantastory aren't paying us to make this review, so you're going to get some brutal honesty here. Let's talk about the positives first, shall we? That shouldn't take too long. The finish isn't overly reflective, apart from phthalo green, so a nice matte to satin finish on most of them. The black is great, after two coats the raw umber is nice, the viridian green is really good, and both siennas, phthalo and cerulean blue are pretty decent after both coats. Sap and pale green are pretty good after two coats as well, but yeah, that's about it. Even with thinning them down to a workable consistency, the grey, white, beige, ultramarine, cobalt blue, rose, orange yellow, and actually all the yellows are pretty much unusable. But some of that won't really come as a surprise to you if you're experienced with miniature painting, as a lot of lighter, more vibrant colours struggle with opacity and take lots of thin coats to build up a solid colour. The only problem is this is just two thin coats applied to a flat surface, and more than half the paints have left behind really visible streaks, which would leave really ugly brush strokes on your models, particularly on smooth bits like armour. When I've used similarly thin transparent paints, like Coat d'Arms for example, you can usually mix in a bit of white paint to get a much more opaque colour for base coating, and then build up to a more vibrant colour from there, but the white in this set is absolute dog shit. I feel like adding that to any of these paints is just going to ruin them. But yeah, I know you didn't click on this video to just watch us paint a bit of card. You want to see if I can actually get a model painted with these, huh? Admit it, you want to see me struggle. 
I asked the channel's Patreon supporters which Ravage star model they wanted me to paint for this video, and they chose this dude, the commander of the Imari faction of the upcoming Siege of Ankar box set from Ravage Star. He's called, let me check, Colonel Bo Boren Trax. Of course he is. An absolutely beautifully sculpted mini with tons of detail that, ordinarily, I'd have loads of fun painting. But today, there's a decent chance that he's going to be a sacrificial lamb on the altar of Jeff Bezos' fake review dystopia warehouse. And yes, that's the same Ravaged Star who kindly sponsored the video, by the way. It's a brand new game system and model line from the glorious heroes over at Mini Wargaming. Those guys literally got me back into miniature wargaming about 10 years ago, so plugging their latest exciting venture is the least I could do to thank them. As I said, this set is part of the new two-player Siege of Ankar box set, which is up for pre-order now. We've covered their Veil-touched and Gorkog minis before in previous videos, and the whole range seems to be really nicely geared for starting out in the hobby. Pre-assembled plastic minis with tons of texture that work amazingly well for dry brushing, contrast paints, and other beginner-friendly techniques. And also, if you're like me, a more casual 40k player who doesn't care about official tournaments or stuff like that, Ravage Star Armies make pretty awesome affordable swap outs for official Warhammer stuff, with the Imari obviously being a great replacement for the Leagues of Votan, the Gorkog being a fun reimagining of the Tyranids, and the spiky power armoured Veil Touch being an easy replacement for the Chaos Space Marines. So follow the link in the description if you fancy a new army, and check out the massive amount of bundle deals they have on pre-orders. Now, let the pain begin. Let's kick off with the cerulean blue to paint the bulk of the armour. All of the brushes are kind of gelled into shape, so a little moisture releases the bristles, and we can crack on. One thin coat of that blue did a pretty good job actually, so I grabbed the ultramarine blue, and while that paint on its own didn't perform too well in the swatch, I thinned it down with lots of water so it was a kind of wash or glaze consistency, and then let that just tint the surface of the armour, making it a bit more saturated. Next I mixed OG cerulean blue with grey to lighten it up, and then dry brushed this slightly lighter blue all over the armour to catch the details. Let's put a pin in the armour and come back to it later. Now I'll switch over to Crimson Red for the cape and fabric. Ugh, it goes on so transparently. It's hard to get an even coat, even when it's all over a flat white grey base coat. This model is already giving me big Thor vibes, so I thought I'd use some yellow ochre, a classic base tone for blonde hair, to lay down the first layer on the helmet plumes and the beard. For now, I'll block in the pistol, the hammer, and the base with some lamp black so it's not so bright and distracting. Now, as this set doesn't come with any metallic paints, I'm going to have to attempt to paint any metallic elements with a technique called non-metallic metal, which is where you'd basically paint the surfaces that would be gold or silver or whatever colour with the colours they'd actually be. Reflections, light blooms, dimpling, texture and all. It's a bit of a pain, and I am not an expert in this technique by any means, but needs must. So I base coated the trim on the pauldrons, shield, and the belt buckle with raw umber, and then thinned some yellow ochre, and started kind of stippling and sketching this on, playing fast and loose with the placement, but basically just trying to build up a slow, mottled texture, leaving the raw umber only in the recesses. I then grabbed some of that orange-yellow, which was very transparent and performed really badly in the swatch, but I just want it quite thin anyway, and using it sparingly to heat up the tone of what was already laid down, rather than actually paint that colour. Once that was done, I then mixed in some of the titanium white into the yellow ochre to start creating stronger, brighter areas, especially on the edges. Ooh, these brushes are not holding up particularly well. About eight layers in from being brand new, and I've already got a massively hooked tip. Oh well, let's just keep going. While I waited for the brighter paint on the gold trim to dry, I gave the fabric another coat of crimson red, and then started glazing some raw umber mixed with the yellow ochre across the faces of the gold I wanted to look less shiny. And then on the other sections I wanted to appear brighter, I glazed on some white mixed with yellow ochre again. Just going back and forth, building up these subtleties to make something that hopefully passes as some kind of reflective metal. As I said, it's really not my thing, but I've got no option here. While I had the raw umber out, I mixed it about half and half with the crimson to create a darker, desaturated red, and painted that up into the recesses of the folds on the fabric and on the underside of the cloak too. Ooh, notice how the black paint has started rubbing off just from me handling the model during painting? You would very rarely get this with regular mini paints, as they tend to be a bit more durable. 
Anyway, let me give the cape a bit more oomph by stippling on some scarlet red onto the peaks of the fabric folds. Stippling, which is just a fancy way of saying tippy-tapping the tip of your brush over the surface, is a good way of utilising paints that don't have great opacity. Because you build the colour and texture up slowly, you don't have to worry about leaving brush strokes behind, because that's kind of the point. Now I think that black weapons would be way too boring for this fancy boy, so I mixed pale green with lamp black to create a really nice dark green, way nicer than any of the other greens in the set, and much more opaque, and used this to base coat those bits, leaving the original black only in the darkest recesses. I then overbrushed some of the nice viridian green onto the weapons, kind of imagining what areas might be most reflective of light to the viewer, but not over-egging it, I just wanted it to be quite subtle. I added a tiny bit of grey paint to that mix, and kept adding smaller and smaller highlights within the areas I initially picked out, until it looked like a semi-plausible shiny green surface. I then used some raw sienna to base coat the earth on the base, mixed in some beige to that colour and dry brushed on some texture, keeping it nice and simple. I then used burnt sienna, thinned heavily just to tone all of that on the base, which will hopefully look like a heavy coating of dust once it's dried. I also used this paint to tint the underside of the green weapons, which will hopefully look like they're kind of catching reflected light from the ground. A subtle effect, but hopefully it'll look quite cool in the finished model if you notice it. Some yellow ochre mixed with white to add a little bit of a reflective light streak across the bulk of the beard, and on the helmet plumes too. Remember, you don't have to worry about painting individual hairs on your minis. This kind of light-based highlight looks great and is way easier. Going back to the armour now, I mixed in some white to the cerulean blue and used this to place some manual scratchy edge highlights around the pointiest or most interesting bits of the armour to intentionally bring out some more detail that the dry brush missed. I then used one of the worst paints from the swatch, Phthalo Blue, just to tint some of the lower sections of the armour and boost the saturation, but also darken down the bottom of the model a bit. And that's kind of it. I gave the model a quick blast of the same varnish I used on all my other painted minis to hopefully prevent any more paint from rubbing off, but yeah, that's a kick-ass Space Dwarf painted using the cheapest paint and brush set on Amazon. What do you think? Do you think these paints did better or worse than you expected? Not gonna lie, I'm pretty happy with how this model turned out, and surprised by quite a few of the paints in that set. The brushes were a bit of a letdown, having pretty rapidly developed hook tips and wonky bodies, but at that price point, essentially free, you can't be too surprised. So there's definitely a couple of things to bear in mind when coming to your own decision about this paint set. I've tried to get the best results I can here, and I used the colours that I knew would have the best chance of making a good looking final model. There are loads of colour combos that would be very hard to paint using this set, particularly anything with yellow or green in it. Also, another thing, I don't want to sound up myself, but I am a very experienced miniature painter. I've painted thousands and thousands of models over the years, mostly to a quick army tabletop standard, but when I try and spend quite a lot of time on a model, I can get pretty decent results. Decent enough to be a finalist in Golden Demon, the world's main Warhammer painting competition. If you are buying this set based on the price, chances are you might be a beginner, and some of the techniques I use to get this result, like stippling, glazing, and non-metallic metal, are skills you need to take time to develop. And you absolutely can do them, but if you're just getting into the hobby, I wouldn't want you to buy these and think, hey, you bloody liar, how come my paint job doesn't look as good as yours when we're using the same paints? So I suppose, in summary, these paints are cheap, and while some of them are really really just not very good at all. Some of them are surprisingly usable, and as I've hopefully shown here, can actually give you some pretty decent results if you play to their strengths. One definite use I can see for these paints is for terrain painting, where the quantity will really benefit you, and their less desirable qualities won't be quite so noticeable as they would be on tiny, more detailed minis. I'll probably keep a hold of these paints, as they'll be fun to use for crafts and painting with my kids, but I personally won't be using them for miniature paints. If you want to grab a set though, you can find a link to this exact set in the video description. It's, it's a titan you like. Is it a titan? Yeah. Wow, I love it, thank you. What have you painted? A yellow gorkonaut. A yellow gorkonaut? Yeah. Cool. Massive thanks to Ravage Star for sponsoring this video. Don't forget to check out their pre-orders if you want to order the new two-player starter set this model is from, or just a cool new proxy 40k army on the cheap. And I'll catch you next time. Bye for now.